So I'll, I'll talk over the next 40, 45 minutes or so and say something about antibiotic resistance in humans, in livestock and the wider environment and how we might put those different compartments together. Uh, my, my name's up as the presenter of this talk, but uh, the work that I'm going to talk about has done uh, lots of other people and I'll try and acknowledge their contributions as we go along. Everybody, I think, will have seen this kind of plot, the timeline of the development of antibiotic resistance. This, this one's from the CDC. I don't know if you can, you probably can't read it from back there. Um, but you can see a sequence of antibiotics being discovered and introduced into human medicine, starting with penicillin. And some years or some decades later, almost inevitably, the occurrence of resistance to these particular antibiotics. Now, it, this is clearly a problem. And right now it's a very high profile problem, not least because of the interest of it in the UK's Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, who has made this something of a personal crusade to try and address the issue of what she calls the antibiotic pipeline dry drying up. And um, quite a nice little primer, quite general, on the nature of the antibiotic crisis. And in Sally's pronouncements, indeed everyone's pronouncements, we make a lot about the potential health burden imposed by the loss of, anti the, of, of useful antibiotics. Now, clearly, returning to a post-antibiotic era is going to be a public health disaster. But we're not there yet. And the concern is, are we on an inevitable route towards that? Uh, and so a number of fairly apocalyptic projections have been made about what would happen and what would be the health burden if that was introduced. And as part of the arguments, we all like to say what the health burden is now. I've done it myself. I've been on the Today programme telling John Humphreys that thousands of people in the UK die of resistant related infections, tens of thousands in Europe, probably hundreds of thousands, but we don't count them around the world. Everybody does it, Sally does this. And having done that a few times, I thought it'd be quite a good point, good idea to look at the actual evidence base for those sort of pronouncements. And so that's some work we've been doing. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you one story. Uh, recently with um, Katrina Waugh, who's in the audience, I'll come to that in a moment, I forgot to say the pipeline hasn't quite dried up. If you read Nature or looked at the press uh, in the last week or so, uh, this is a report of a new class of antibiotics I'm not sure quite how to pronounce it. I think it's tyxobactin. Is that correct? Uh, and it, it's an interesting antibiotic, not least because of, of its potential as a therapeutic, but also because the way in which this particular antibiotic was discovered, which is by looking at the unculturable fraction of the soil microbiota, and I'll come to that later on. It's, it's, uh, uh, the pipeline may not be quite entirely dry. So what I'll talk about then is this work on burden, as I say, that Katrina has been uh, mostly focusing on for the last few months. Uh, and then I'll move into the second part of the talk, which actually comes out of a presentation I gave at the Royal Society in the summer, which covers where we find antimicrobial resistance in those different compartments in humans, livestock, and the environment, and so on. Uh, antibiotic usage and resistance, particularly in livestock and in the wider environment. And then I'll talk at the end about some ideas about governance and regulation of antimicrobial resistance uh, at an international scale. So going back to the, the health burden issue, what this actually might be, it would be nice to have a formal definition of the burden of antimicrobial resistance. And you can Google it, but there ain't one. Um, so as a working approximation, we're looking towards this one that, that uh, we, we devised in my group. Total disease burden associated with the failure of antimicrobial treatment, which seems a reasonable starting point. And in trying to narrow the problem down, and don't want to narrow it too much, looking at a number of different clinical conditions, uh, diarrhea, sepsis, and urinary tract infections, where clearly antibiotics are potentially useful uh, as therapeutics. And as a very basic starting point, it would be nice to have disease burden estimates for those clinical conditions. This is the sort of thing uh, that the Centre for Population Health Sciences, and Harry Campbell's there, has been doing quite a lot of in other contexts. Um, well, we do have some for diarrhoea, 
uh, but not for sepsis and not for UTIs. They're not really there, the global disease burden estimates. So that's a, not a great start. We also, of course, need to focus on particular organisms associated with these conditions. Again, we're not going through the whole range of bacteria. I'll come to that later on. Uh, so as a starting point, we're focusing particularly on the ones we have some background with in my group, E. coli uh, and Staph aureus. But of course, the link between that and that is all about etiology. And again, that's not often broken down in any detail at a, at a global scale. I mean, obviously there are individual studies reporting etiology, but it's a problem matching the bug and the disease together. And when you then add the drug into the equation, the ones we're focusing on are the ones focused on by the WHO in a recent report that I'll come to, third generation and fourth generation cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, carbapenems. We have a number of issues about the drugs we would like information on their usage and how they use to treat these different conditions or possibly in the context of the different bacteria, the levels of resistance and treatment failures. And I'll go through all those in the next few slides, but the bottom line, the point I'm going to make is actually we don't have good estimates of the vast majority of these components of this definition of a burden of resistance. So there are some really quite major gaps there in the evidence base. So, but this is one example of where people have looked specifically at antibiotic usage, a paper that came out last year in Lancet Infectious Diseases. And what they looked at, um, the, the methodology is quite, quite a complex mixture of survey and calculation, but they looked at usage of different classes of antibiotics in a number of different countries, not every country in the world by any means, between 2000 and 2010, so over a decade. And basic summary is that human usage of antibiotics is quite well documented in places like Europe, uh, but much less well documented elsewhere, particularly Africa, so the coverage is not even at all. Global consumption of antibiotics has increased by 36% over that decade, and particular countries, Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa, Africa are accounting for a lot of this increase, which probably wouldn't surprise people. There are increased consumption of some uh, not quite last resort drugs, but close to it, the carbapenems and the polymyxins, although carbapenems are just down here, polymyxins are down here, so they're still very, very low levels of usage compared with the penicillins and the cephalosporins and the macrolides and so on. So the, the, there's increase across the board there. What this study doesn't tell us is exactly what these drugs are being used for and how you might match this particular consumption of antibiotics to the particular clinical conditions that are a concern in, the, in those various countries. I mentioned earlier the World Health Organization's report on antimicrobial resistance that, that came out last year, and that also was another attempt to do some sort of systematic survey of what's going on at an international level. So it looked at the current status and availability of resistance data in every single WHO region, and it made some comment on the health and the economic burden of resistance. And these are the key findings. High resistance rates in the common bacteria in all WHO regions, no great surprise there for a, a lot of effort. Significant gaps in resistance surveillance with a lack of standard methodology and data sharing. Uh, well, again, no surprise, but nice to have it from an authoritative source. And I'll show you an illustration of some of those gaps later on. And Again, not perhaps devastatingly surprising conclusion, patients with resistant infections have increased risk of worse clinical outcomes and consume more healthcare resources. And I have to say a lot of people have criticized this effort as a very large amount of effort to tell us something we already knew. The question is not whether those things happen, but can we quantify them? Can we actually produce some hard quantitative data about these various components of the antimicrobial resistance problem? Well, here's one attempt, and uh, Katrina put these figures together by extracting them from the actual raw data published at the back of the report. And, it, and here's one example. Can you use the data in the WHO report to get some idea of how good global surveillance for resistance actually is? So one of the combinations they looked at was E. coli and third-generation cephalosporins. And what this shows is the number of isolates that were submitted by that country in response to the WHO request to that country for, for information. And as you can see, a large number of countries, almost half of the ones 
involved didn't actually submit anything at all, through, certainly not through official channels. Some of them submitted data from a very good number of samples, over 3,000. I have to say what actual isolates these were is extremely variable and not particularly well recorded in the report. Uh, but the numbers at least are reasonable, suggesting there's some effort. But that goes all the way down to some countries that their data is based on less than 30 isolates, uh, which ain't great data for this sort of thing. And you can see the distribution. So it's, it's not, not particularly encouraging. You can weight those data not by the number of countries, uh, but actually by the population they represent. And you could argue that the, the green in this area, so looks like reasonable surveillance effort, if you count 30 as reasonable, slightly more than half the global population is under surveillance in that sense. You do the same thing with non-typhoidal salmonella, for example, and resistance to fluoroquinolones. And actually, it's a pretty similar picture. Uh, again, this time slightly more than half the country is not really reporting at all, and only a few reporting what you might recall call reasonable numbers of isolates. And that picture is really reflected against most of the drug-bug combinations uh, that are covered in that report. So there really do seem to be significant gaps. At the back of the envelope, I'd say half the world is not really being covered by these surveillance systems the WHO was tapping into. And then the, the third area I want to touch on in terms of the evidence base really seems to me to be the core of the matter, treatment failures. That's actually what the problem is. Uh, so do we have data on treatment failures? Well, there was a, an interesting and much discussed paper that came out in BMJ last year by Curry et al. And what that looked for was reported, or not reported, but estimated treatment failure for four common infections uh, over about 20 year period. So those are the four infections there, including upper and lower respiratory tract infections. And they got their data from 700 primary care facilities in the UK, uh, covering about 14 million patients. So it's quite an extensive data set. And what they got was the answer that one in 10 first-line antibiotic therapies failed by their definition. And over that 20 year, there was a, a slight, but given the large sample size, measurable increase in the failure rate. There's a lot to discuss in this analysis but one of the most important things is what actually is failure. And the operational definition they had was the patient came back within 30 years. Now, why, sorry, within 30 years, I beg your pardon, within 30 days. So why they came back, a uh, number of reasons, and of course there is no indication of what actual was the etiological agent underlying this. For example, what if they had viral infections, obviously. And so we don't really know what that increase represents. There are all sorts of reasons why the number of patients coming back within 30 days after having an antibiotic treatment or antibiotic prescribed uh, has increased by a small amount. I'm, I'm, I'm quite supportive of the paper because you've got to start somewhere, but it, it is clearly a very crude attempt to get at what is an extremely important problem. The other reason I'm supportive of the paper, hardly anyone is doing this. There are very, very few studies looking at treatment failures. So uh, the, the, the database here, and as I say, this seems to me to be the issue that really matters, uh, is extremely weak. Um, we, don't, we don't really have it. So I hope you can see from all that that putting all this information together and getting an answer, what actually is the global burden of antimicrobial resistance? Well, I, I think we're quite a long way from that. But there may, be, there may be cleverer people in the audience than me who can think of a way through. Uh, the, the information available. Good. Well, let me move on to the, the second part of the talk then, uh, and this um, is actually coming out in a, a paper that arose from the Royal Society meeting that should be published in a, in a special volume later this month. So where we find AMR usage and resistance in livestock and in the wider community and governance and regulation. Well, a good place to start is just from the top, what diversity of bacteria are we talking about overall? There is no good estimate of the diversity, the number of different bacterial species in the global environment. Um, in fact, there's no really good agreement about what is a species when it comes to bacteria. I mean, how, do you, how do you actually define that? But given standard taxonomies, NCBI taxonomies and so, 
the best guess that people, that, that people make, and it, it is just a guess, is there are potentially millions of species using the current sort of definition, of which we know only a fraction now. We have a slightly better growing idea of the diversity of the normal flora in a human being. And this mostly comes from the microbiome studies that have become very fashionable over the last decade or so. Uh, but certainly thousands of species that normally live on or in humans. We have a slightly clear idea of the number of those species that might actually cause us harm, the opportunistic pathogens. So often just part of the normal microbiome, uh, commensal organisms, but under some circumstances can cause disease. Hundreds, hundreds of species fall into that category, uh, over 500 by uh, best guess. The number of bacteria that specialize in infecting and causing disease in humans is very, very small. It's in the tens. You can argue about the exact definitions, but it is a very, very tiny fraction of the diversity. And it's, it's this group and some of these groups, of course, that we're, we're most concerned about. But it is a very, very tiny fraction of the total diversity out there. So, you know, we're thinking things like microbacterium, tuberculosis, or gonorrhea, and so on, uh, the, the specialist human pathogens. That's a very rare lifestyle for a bacteria. Humans are not the only host, and particularly of interest for this talk is livestock, domestic livestock, and essentially exactly the same sort of numbers are likely to apply to a cow or a pig or a chicken. What we are coming to realize, of course, is that the pathogens and the commensals present in humans and these other species actually overlap a good deal. There's a lot of exchange of bacterial populations, and I'll come on to some of the evidence for that between the two kinds of population. And we're also beginning to understand that all these categories are somewhat leaky, in that bacteria can essentially change their lifestyles and evolve from one to another relatively straightforwardly, relatively quickly. It's a dynamic situation. What we're also doing from a, both a public health and animal health perspective is putting antibiotics into the system. We put it in, in two ways. We put it into the human pathogens, because we're concerned about those, but we also put antibiotics into livestock populations in a way that I'll come back to, regardless, to a large extent, of whether they're actually sick or not, whether they've got a bacterial disease or not. It's a very complex relationship, then, between resistant and resistant bacterial and disease due to resistant bacterial in the human and the livestock populations. Uh, you can see many of these sorts of diagrams, but the antibiotics are going into both populations, and there are lots of routes in which resistance in one form or another can spread between livestock and humans via food directly, via the environment, and so on, in, in both directions. And the modes of movement that we're concerned about here are the bacteria themselves. And as I'll show you in a moment, we can now begin to do some tracking of that, particularly by whole genome sequencing and genotyping. So we can see how the bacteria are moving between these different compartments in this sort of diagram. The mobile genetic elements that often carry resistance can also move from one compartment to another. The drugs can move. They can spill over from where they're put into the system, into other parts of the system. Uh, one way you might get drugs from, that are given to animals in humans is via food, but I have to say certainly in the UK and, and most of the Northern Hemisphere, that's, I think that route's been closed off. There are the withdrawal regulations that mean you can't actually give antibiotics to animals for I think it's about seven days before you slaughter them, and the medicine, veterinary medicine directorate surveys that and checks that that's done. So maybe that particular door is closed. Uh, animal feed is a, a, a different matter. That can be contaminated with resistance genes, and often is. And very interestingly, uh, one study has found that you can actually detect resistance genes as a contaminant of antibiotics, which does seem to be an extraordinary problem. Um, that you're actually giving the antibiotic with some of the resistance elements with it. We have the same difficulty with understanding the dynamics of this exchange as we did with the burden estimates before. We can point to the sorts of things that are going on in a qualitative sense, but we can't quantify it. 
we're a very quantitative research group uh, over at King's Buildings, and one of our maxims is that quote by Lord Kelvin. When you can measure it, what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge about it is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. Not in every context, but in the context that we're, we're working here, I think that's right. Putting arrows on that diagram really doesn't help decide what you should be most concerned about in terms of animal and public health. You need the numbers. And as I said, it's a complex system. That doesn't scare us. We look at the dynamics of very complex systems in ours and many other groups, looking at various ecological systems where different compartments interact. We can do that. What bothers me more is the idiosyncrasy. You've got a lot of different combinations here. You've got a little, lot of different bugs, a lot of different drugs, a uh, lot of different geographical areas, a lot of different kinds of hosts, and is the same, well, it's not, is it? The, the same dynamics do not apply to every single combination. Are, are we going to have to work our way through every single one individually before we have a comprehensive understanding of what's going on? Let's just take a bit of a broader perspective for a moment and see where in that system we might be finding sources of resistance, of antimicrobial resistance. Well, one interesting source is not in the, in the pathogens, in the disease-causing organisms, but in the commensals. This is sometimes referred to as the, the microbial dark matter, the bacterial populations that we haven't traditionally been able to study, a lot of it we can't culture, both in human guts or animal guts, but also in the soil. But we do know from metagenomic studies that there is quite an extensive diversity of resistance genes in this commensal microbiota. So they're already in us, but in our commensal bacteria. And there are some uh, homologous resistance genes to ones that we find in, in pathogens. So we, we know there's a potential for a source of resistance actually already sitting within us. Another potential reservoir of resistance is the soil. The soil is actually the source of more than 80% 80, 80 of antibiotics that have been discovered so far, and it was the source of Tyxobactin, the one that I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk. The soil also contains resistance genes which are 100% homologous to the resistance genes of all major classes of antibiotics. Again, from metagenomic studies, we know that that's the case. And most people would take that to imply there is evidence of horizontal gene transfer with the pathogens that we treat in the clinic or on the farm. But of course it doesn't in itself tell us what direction the transfer is. And that's an interesting problem. For example, you do find resistance to synthetic quinolones in the soil. Well, that surely must have come from the clinic. Because that would be, seem natural. But if you st step back and take a broader perspective and look at the evolutionary origins of the genes, which are homologous to the ones expressing resistance to synthetic quinolones, those do come from soil bacteria. So, so the material is there in the soil, and that has evolved in, in the clinic in response to the pressure from this particular kind of drug. Uh, and, yet, and then we find it in the soil again. Some concern over water is clearly less important as a source of bacteria than commensals or, or soil, uh, but there are issues about it, particularly over aqu aquaculture, uh, which is a, has been in the past a heavy consumer of antibiotics, but is not so much, in, at least in, um, in Europe nowadays. And then the other important reservoir I want to talk about is farm animals, and that deserves quite a lot more discussion. In trying to understand the use of antibiotics in farm animals, you have to have at least a, a cursory knowledge of how industrial agriculture works. And perhaps the most important thing to say about it is it works with very, very small margins. So the animals, be they particularly pigs and poultry, dairy cattle as well, are being pushed to their absolute metabolic limits. Really, we're squeezing every last drop of milk or gram of beef or pork out of them. It also works with very, very small profit margins. So when you buy your chicken, free range or not, out of a supermarket, profit to the farmer or the producer on that is probably of the order of pennies. So they, it's a difficult system to tinker with because it's, 
really operating right, right to the wire, both economically in terms of, of productivity. And in this system, antibiotics are used as therapeutics, but that's a very, very minor part of it. Metaphylactics, and what that means is if you have any evidence of disease in your flock or your herd, you don't just treat the sick animals, you treat them all. Prophylaxis, which means what it says, you treat them in advance of disease, and, importantly, growth promoters. Growth promoters is a very controversial subject. So a quick resume of what growth promoters are and what they do. They've actually been used for over half a century now. They work, uh, at least according to the published literature, there isn't a lot of literature that goes back, uh, of recent literature, but they do produce something like a 15 to 20% higher weight gain in the animals. And given that observation, that really matters. That's a very, very big increase. They're interesting scientifically because we don't really understand them. They work for antibacterials, but they don't, what doesn't work for antifungals or antivirals. Uh, the mechanism we don't know at all. There was a paper published in Nature a few years ago which turned out to be a very detailed study of being unable to find what the mechanism was in mice. Uh, we don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, interestingly, it works in children, uh, but I don't recommend you try it on your own, particularly. Uh, but it, it, it does. So there's some, there's some interesting science to be done around growth promotion. However, as I said, it's very controversial, and there was quite a lot of history up to this point, but perhaps the biggest ever measure to try and reduce antibiotic use anywhere in the world was the EU growth promoter ban in 2006. So it was no longer possible to use any antibiotic in food animals in order just simply to promote growth. So that, that is the standout intervention globally in the last 50 years. And because we have data on antimicrobial consumption in the veterinary fields uh, from this organization called SVAC, which publishes quite regularly, we can look to see what the growth promoter ban achieved in terms of net antibiotic consumption. Well, there's some variation from drug to drug and country to country, but it doesn't look very promising. This is the net use across Europe of third and fourth generation cephalosporins, round about the same, maybe a slight increase, definitely no increase, decrease post-2006, and fluoroquinolones still rising steadily. That's the result of the growth promoter ban. Nothing happened much. Why not? Well, instead of using the drugs as growth promoters, there's been a marked increase in therapeutic and particularly metaphylactic use. There's been a marked increase in prophylactic use, especially for poultry. I don't know how many people here have actually been inside one of these intensive poultry production units. It's, it, it's not an experience I recommend for the faint-hearted. These are, these are not particularly nice places. Um, but the moment you go in one, or even see a picture like that, you can see why keeping disease out is both extremely difficult and incredibly important. Uh, so poultry, poultry farmers take a precautionary approach. They use prophylactics and they're allowed to. So the UK is still using something like 700 grams of antibiotic per tonne meat, which is as much as anywhere. So it has proved difficult, well, in fact it hasn't worked, to try and reduce antibiotic consumption in animals by, by banning growth promoters. And it is still true overall, uh, certainly where there is industrial agriculture happening in Europe, North America, and increasingly in Asia, that antibiotic in livestock is of the same order in terms of volume of drug used as it is in humans. So that's a, a massive consumption. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, you don't have to look very hard to find evidence of antibiotic resistance in animal populations. My own group was doing this in the 1990s. We were particularly interested in cattle and drug-resistant E. coli that we found in cattle. And we found it everywhere we looked. We found it in calves that were a few days old. Uh, we found it particularly in organic farms. Doesn't make any difference whether your farm is organic or not. Same levels of antibiotic resistance. Very, very easy to find. And lots of people have done that sort of study over the years. And of course, it's still going on. So there was a fairly recent report, not much more than a year ago, of the first report of carbapenem resistance from livestock farms. And that's turned up in a few species now. That's interesting because these ones, well, OK, we, didn't, we weren't expecting too much antibiotic use on organic farms, and that didn't seem to make a difference. But there is certainly no use of carbapenems on the farms. That's 
reserved for human use, and yet you can still find the resistance there. So that immediately tells you that these resistances are not necessarily actually coming out of the farms or drug usage on the farms. And you can explore that sort of idea in much more detail nowadays using uh, sequencing technology and the analysis of bacterial sequence data. And there's been a number of studies of that kind building up over the past few years. This is a, a study from what, five, six years ago now of a particular strain of MRSA in humans and poultry. And one of the conclusions of that study is that particular strain of MRSA in poultry seemed to be derived from humans rather than the other way around. So that's interesting. There was quite a high profile study published a year and a half ago now on Salmonella typhimurium DT104 in humans and cattle. And that looked at the rate of exchange based on their analysis of sequence data between humans and livestock and livestock and humans. And what they found was that most of the time you got a movement of bacteria, it was within the species, but there were significant rates of movement from animals to humans, which ought to expect. DT104 is thought of as a foodborne zoonotic infection, but also in the other direction. And indeed, it turned out that there was quite a lot of what looked like human-to-human -human transmission of DT104. So that changes our understanding of the epidemiology of this particular pathogen, and also points to the fact, again, that the traffic seems to be in both directions. There seems to be movement from animals to humans and from humans to animals. And then in a slightly more recent study looked at another strain of MRSA, CC97, uh, and again showing much the same sort of thing. In this particular case, uh, this strain does seem to have a, a cattle origin and you see some evidence of movement into humans. Um, so you can, you can track all this using sequence technology. So we've been doing some of this in my group and this is particularly the work of uh, Melissa Ward. And she's taken another particular lineage uh, strain of MRSA, CC398, and what she's done here is produce a phylogeny based on se whole genome sequence data of those strains. And what she's done here is map whether those strains were found in humans or livestock, and also whether or not the sequences include, uh, include the presence or absence of particular virulence factors, and also particular antibiotic resistances. Uh, and you can see the sorts of pattern there. And you can do some analysis called discrete traits analysis on this sort of data. So here's one example that Melissa did. You can see here a predominantly human lineage of this bacteria that at least on one occasion has got into livestock. And here you can see a predominantly livestock lineage of this bacteria that on a number of occasions has got into humans. And you can map that out. So in this particular case, livestock to human transmission seems to occur more commonly than human to livestock. But again, it does go in both directions. So that's one thing you can do with those sorts of data. You can also do something else. We published this last year, and I'm really quite excited about it, because it's the first time anyone's used sequence data to track the movement of antibiotic resistance between populations like this. And we can do that because we can simply read the resistance traits off the, sequ off the genome. Uh, so what this has done here is exactly the same thing, but what she's plotted is whether or not they carry methicillin resistance or tetracycline resistance. And you can see these two sorts of antibiotics have very different dynamics. MECA, which confers methicillin resistance on a mobile element, is, quite, is indeed quite mobile. It moves to and from human and livestock populations, oh, sorry, to and, to and from different bacterial populations quite easily. Tetracycline resistance, in this case the TETM gene, which is chromosomal, is not. That, that's much harder to switch. It only happens twice in the whole lineage. Uh, and so you can see that there are many more jumps of MECA between bacterial populations than there are of TETM. It, it is indeed much more mobile. That particular result I don't think would surprise anyone, although it's nice to be able to quantify it. But what I do like it is proof of principle that you can actually track the movement of resistances in this kind of way. So what do we conclude from all this? Well, the medics in particular like to have lots of meetings saying, emphasizing how the misuse of antibiotics in animal populations is impacting on human health. But if you turn it around, you had a, that's a scene obviously from Animal Farm, if there was a meeting of pigs, they would doubtless be complaining about the misuse of antibiotic resistance in humans and the threat that poses to porcine health. It's a two-way process, uh, very much so. And it's very difficult on a particular uh, event to say in which direction the problem really lies.
I was uh, told by Sally Davis the other day that she has started to moderate her criticism of veterinary use of antibiotics as a result of arguments like this. She, she, she says what she says is she understands it better now. We would like to know the extent of the problem, uh, and that's a difficulty because no one's quite clear whether this movement of antibiotic resistance from humans to animals, or particularly vice versa, is in WHO remat or the equivalent of WHO for animal health, the OIE, the World Health Organization for Animals. Uh, in the UK, we have the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, and they recognize that they do need to be looking in both sectors, and the latest DEFRA Department of Health five-year plan highlights the need to look in both places. In terms of how we look for antimicrobial resistance, in, particularly in livestock populations, well, that's, that's actually quite difficult. We do it quite well in, in the UK through the Veterinary Medicine Directorate, but globally it's much more difficult. And the sorts of things people are looking at now is whether these uh, automated surveillance systems like HealthMap, if you know that that, that, that monitors human disease outbreaks globally by using web crawlers to track reports that are on the internet doesn't yet use social media. Um, I wonder if it, it will at some stage. Uh, can you use that to look at antibiotic resistances in animals? People are very interested in that sort of possibility. You could of course go out and look for it. You could try to identify hotspots where you thought there might be particular problems and people have done that sort of approach for antimicrobial resistance. And then of course you need to back this up with actual collections of isolates, typing and sequencing, and all, all the metadata that goes with it. But basically, at the present, the state of art for surveillance, and it's certainly integrated surveillance, is quite, quite poor. The flagship country is probably Denmark, which has got a, a, quite a big effort to try and monitor levels of resistance and bacterial disease in both humans and livestock at the same time. But of course, that is not the whole story. You do have this issue, as I mentioned earlier, with the soil of resistance occurring in the wider environment. The light at the end of the tunnel for me is actually this sort of problem in trying to get information from animal populations on a potential threat to human health is not a unique problem. We've been discussing it for many years now, and I was a contributor to this Institute of Medicine report a few years ago, in the concept of emerging infectious diseases and the zoonotic origins of those, whether it's something like influenza from swine or from birds, or of course Ebola virus from bats is much more topical. Uh, but a lot of thought has gone into how actually we would get international health systems to carry out effective surveillance and reporting of zoonotic infections of that kind, and could those sorts of arguments be used for antimicrobial resistance in animal populations as well? And I think that's a, possibly a good starting point. The way we go about managing it is, well, we do try and reduce usage, and of course I mentioned about the growth promoter ban recently, otherwise it's voluntary codes. The US just introduced a voluntary code for its livestock industry. No one's particularly optimistic that will make a huge difference. There are various clever ways in which we might use antibiotics more intelligently in animals, which are exactly the same sorts of things that people talk about in humans. We do wonder for both animals as well as humans whether antimicrobial resistance gene profiling in real time, so basically using real time sequence data to get an idea of what resistance carried, would be effective in reducing people's willingness to use antibiotics in animal populations. And I'm slightly optimistic that this might work better in animals than it does in humans. When you say this sort of thing to a clinician, these are the clinicians I speak to, there are others in the audience, they say, oh yeah, but we'd, we'd still have to do culture. We wouldn't believe it until we saw culture. Oh, well, yeah, maybe. However, farmers have a different perspective on this. What they don't want to do is waste money. So they don't want to give an antibiotic that actually isn't going to cure their disease problem. So I, I think there is some, some hope there that, that maybe they'll be more receptive to this sort of approach than uh, perhaps the, the medical community. What I am clear about in animal populations, this is a point again repeatedly made to our own chief medical officer, is a blanket ban on the use of them, which is the most extreme thing, is simply not going to work. It's not going to work from an animal point of view because there would be costs for animal health, animal welfare and productivity. Ultimately, the price of what you pay in the supermarket would go up if you simply did it that way, that very crude approach. And for the reasons I've given earlier on, it's not clear that there would be a massive impact, at least in the short term, on human health. Most of the antibiotic resistance in human populations comes from the use of antibiotics in human populations. And 
what most people are now advocating, I think that's right, is a parallel approach, where if we reduce usage in humans and animals simultaneously. There are, I won't go into this in any detail, there are a number of alternatives available in livestock, prebiotics, probiotics, phage therapy, use of phage lysins, various kinds of vaccination, maybe even breeding livestock that don't get the bacterial diseases that we're concerned about and combinations of those, all the same sorts of things that people talk about in humans. And just like in humans, for the large part, although these exist, they are a long, long way from being able to roll out on the massive scale that we required <laughs> globally. Uh, the, the one that is the lowest hanging fruit in a sense is probably vaccination. There's a lot of interest in whether some of these diseases that are currently uh, treated using antibiotics could actually be prevented using vaccines. Uh, but this is not a, a quick fix. Resistance in the environment. Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are an awful lot of bacteria out there. 50 tonnes per person by a very, very crude back-of-the-envelope calculation. That's equivalent to a herd of elephants' worth of bacteria for every man, woman and child on this, in this room or on this planet. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of bacteria out there. Those bacteria produce antibiotics. They have done, as far as we can tell, for uh, literally a billion or two billion years. And many people would argue that what's going on in that natural, that huge natural process, is co-evolution. That bacteria produce antibiotics for the purpose of killing other bacteria, and the other bacteria evolve resistance. And they reach some sort of dynamic equilibrium, and people draw graphs like this. Uh, this is, I, the reference has fallen off, but this is Chait et al. in Nature Chemical Biology a couple of years ago. Uh, where they look at antibiotic production by humans, which is about 170,000 tonnes per year, or 20 tonnes per hour, if you refer. That's production and use. And they say, here's the natural production of antibiotics in the soil, and here's human, human production and consumption overtaking it dramatically. Where do they get that line from? Nowhere. Just made it up. Oh, sorry. Why not put it up there? It may be that human production of antibiotics is still trailing natural production of antibiotics by orders of magnitude, for all anyone knows. There are no good estimates of exactly how much antibiotic is being produced out there. And what this sort of argument suggests to me is a question of whether or not there is some kind of level of antimicrobial use that is ecologically and evolutionary stable and sustainable, that you could actually have a certain level of usage that would not uh, induce resistance at devastatingly high rates. No one knows what that is, but it's an awful lot less than we use now, I suspect. And that sort of thinking led me and my colleague Jeremy Farrar to think about some parallels between AMR and climate change. These are three similarities we identified. They're both natural processes. They both actually operate on a global scale and human involvement, influence of them, is quite recent. But there are some differences. In terms of CO2 emissions and climate change, there are alternative technologies available. They're being rolled out on a limited scale. But we do have some alternative technologies available for antibiotics in both humans and livestock, but we're a long way from being able to roll those out. So we're well behind. The climate change people have targets. You could argue about the targets and the evidence base, but yes, we should reduce CO2 emissions by so much. Not only do we not have targets for reductions in, well, actually, it's not quite true we don't have targets. We have two. We have a UK one for hospital use and a, a Netherlands one for agricultural use, and both of them are made up, just plucked from the air. Uh, so we don't even know how to set the targets to get that sustainable use, I was reflecting commenting on a moment ago. And the other thing we don't have is anything like an IPCC, an inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So Jeremy and I thought, actually, we really ought to have one. Um, currently, the, the remit is with the WHO and their I think that's special you know, scientific and technical advisory group on AMR. And there are precedents for this sort of international governance approach, not only the IPCC, uh, but the environmental equivalent, and indeed the international cooperation that produce smallpox eradication. If we did do it, it would need to be global, it would need to be cross-sectorial, it would need to be interdisciplinary because this is a problem that covers lots of areas, not just clinical and veterinary medicine, but microbiology, and I would say microbe ecology, but economics, law and social science. It's a very broad 
issue this one. It would need to be multi-agency. WHO just doesn't have a broad enough remit to cover every area here. And importantly, it would have to buy in for all these people that are medics, patients, vets, farmers, industry and governments that are essentially the problem and are therefore also the solution. Uh, we'd need to involve all those. And it would need an agenda. And it seems to me that the first bit's obvious to improved antimicrobial studentship, but how we move away, how we wean ourselves off antibiotics and onto sustainable alternatives that we can manage in the, the much longer term. As I said, a, a lot of people who've contributed this, particular thanks to Katrina, uh, who did a lot of the burden work that I reported at the beginning, and to many other colleagues who've contributed to those thoughts. Thank you for listening. <laughs>